We are going to talk today about the new public charge rule and the per country limitation. Um, obviously, there's a little bit of history on the public charge in the last few years, and those who filed adjustment of status in October uh, had the pleasure of turning some ridiculous amount of documentation. Uh, and now things have changed back to the pre Trump era. We're going to talk about that. And the per country limitation. Uh, I'm Sam Shehab. I'm Brian Burke. And we're from the law firm of Sam Shehab and Associates. And we're going to take a moment here and get back to discuss those two important topics. All right, so the public charge rule um, is we can spend a lot of time talking about it, but we are going to give you a summary today. Um, let's start with the basic rule on public charge. Yeah. The basic rule on public charge is very simple. If you are dependent on government benefits, on, gov on the U.S. government, you cannot get a green card simple. Um, if you can show that you're not dependent, then you can get your adjustment approved. So it's an important requirement. It's an inadmissibility requirement, meaning that you cannot adjust status unless you're able to show that you are not likely to become public charge uh, on the U.S. government. The money paid by taxpayers cannot be go going to support immigrants coming into the country. It has, uh, immigrants coming to this country has to be self-sufficient, with some exceptions. But with regard to employment immigration and family immigration, that's a requirement. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's really the basic rule. Yeah, and well, I guess, Sam, I want to say, you know, why are we talking about, about this? You know, a lot of people in our audience are employment-based uh, immigrants, and I still think it's worth, you know, relevant to them because, you know, a lot of these people are, you know, employment-based immigrants. They have a job. They really don't have to worry about this. But these things often come up in terms of family members. You know, I have a kid with special needs, and you know, can I take government benefits? Is that going to impact our family's ability to get green cards? And it's a question which usually works out in everybody's favor, but it's definitely worth talking about. Yeah. And the, um, the test is... Um that you are likely to become a public charge. So even if, um, I mean, the way the, the, the statute is written, it is not what you have done in the past. It's what you are likely to do in the future. And because of the way it was written, uh, the Trump administration took advantage of that and created this massive web yeah. Of requirements. So uh, I, I, I can't resist any, top, any opportunity to talk about the Trump administration form of public charge. So if those of you who filed green cards in October 2020, you know, if you wanted to hear it, to hear me swear, you would have just said the word uh, I-944, which was the public charge form that the Donald Trump administration put into place. Uh, for your green card applications, you know, when we request it, you know, credit reports, um, home home mortgage records or appraisals, educational credentials. All loans. Yeah, all loans. Credit card. Uh, Qu credit card statements, bank record. account statements. All these things were sort of, you know, it was your first time filing a, a green card. Uh, those things were sort of unprecedented requests for us because uh, they were came out of the blue and they were... That was, you know, the administration's policy that we we're going to make really double check to make sure that potential immigrants aren't going to be burdens of the government by taking a look at all of their assets, all of everything going on in their life to make sure that they are financially sound investments in immigration. And um, long story short, um, there was a lot of court fights over it. I believe it got, you know, taken away for a little bit and then turned back on. And well, long story short. Um, Shortly after, you know, everybody who would have filed green cards in October 2020, um, you know, they got their cases filed. Uh, eventually, the public charge rule was was thrown out, and the well, there was a court case, and basically, the Biden administration chose not to pursue it any further, and basically, they said no more, and they reverted back uh, to their old policy, and now they published a new rule because that's what government government uh, does, and that's kind of what we're talking about here today. So the new rule, which is effective on December 23rd, 2022. Merry Christmas. Uh, does not apply retroactively. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, um, the old, under the old rule, I mean, the Biden administration has 
discretion and how they review these documents because because the, how likely you'll become a public charge is a very subjective area. So all this massive information that was collected on these adjustment of status, uh, there is not a clear way of evaluating it. Also, there's a lot of discretion, and there was a point system. Mm -hmm. So the Biden administration has a lot of discretion. So I'm not worried about all these adjustment cases. I don't think I have seen a single public charge uh, case in any of the adjustments that we've had. No, not, not at all. I mean, thinking back uh, to, to that, that whole group of green card cases, I can't think of, I mean, I think of maybe out of the many, many cases we filed, you know, maybe, you know, four or five people having legitimate questions on public charge, and then, you know, basically everything kind of, you know, uh, yeah. working out in their, in their favor uh, anyway. Yeah. So if you file your adjustment of status on December 22nd, 2022 and forward, this new revised public charge rule will apply to you, which is the more relaxed public charge rule that brings back to the 1999 memo on public charge, which was a, what the Biden administration calls their rule, a humane uh, and considerate approach to evaluating public charge. Yeah. Um, so in the essence of it, they came out with a broad list of items that they consider are a concern for public charge, so people know what public charge is, Brian. Yeah. And, um, uh, and it's kind of a little bit broad, but it's worth listing and talking about. Uh, so public cash assistance for income maintenance, meaning supplemental social security, uh, cash assistance for income maintenance under the temporary um, assistance for needy family, state, tribal, and territorial or local cash benefit programs uh, for income maintenance, and long-term institutionalization at government expense as the benefit that, the, that are listing for, um, that could trigger public yeah, charge. Yeah, and per my reading of, a reading of the uh, public charge rule, there's basically sort of two broad categories. It's, you know, uh, cash, it's the cash assistance, which a lot of those programs f fall under, if cash assistance for income maintenance or the uh, long-term institutional, institutionalization. When I had to explain this in English, because mm -hmm. we're speaking legal stuff and people are saying, what the heck those two guys are talking about? When I explain this in English to people in simple terms, if you're receiving money not related to your employment, from a government source, you should be concerned. Emergency government assistance. God forbid there's a car accident and you're transported to a hospital for emergency treatment. Uh, you're admitted for, you know, life-threatening. These are not public charge concerns. Um, these are, you know, monies. I mean, it's, it's basically because we're human beings, this money is expected. Yeah. You know, unanticipated. Uh, but if you are receiving a check from the government on a regular basis based on low income or no income, unrelated to unemployment compensation, uh, you should be concerned. Yeah. Uh, you have some kind of a, a, you go to the hospital, those are the scenarios. We go to the hospital and they say, oh, your income is so low. Once you sign up for this, now you can get free medical assistance, regular medical assistance, not emergency, mm -hmm. then you should be concerned. Um, there was really no, um, a bright line. Uh, there, I mean, they're defined, they're a little bit more defined now, which is really helpful yeah. uh, than before. Uh, but, uh, but that's really your guide. Uh, you're getting money and you're not working hard for it and it's not emergency situation, for example, you know, car accident, health crisis, something. Um, then, then you should be in good shape. Yeah, I mean that's really kind of kind of it it for yeah. for me. It's an interesting new. I mean, it's interesting that the new rule has uh, come out. We were perfectly fine operating on the old uh, policy, but um, yeah. Now, because uh, um, because the requirement of likely to become a public benefit is a, a kind of a, a forward look requirement, 
this this administration said we're not gonna we're not gonna play this game with people. The benefit must be actually received. Uh, uh, so they're gonna look at. Well, other factors. I mean, well, I mean, it's, it's what I, I, I want to bring up. I mean, yeah. they have a list of other factors that they'll, they'll yeah. look at. Sure. I mean, so I kind of like this. You know, when we when they announced this this rule, I I, I came in and and said, everybody, look, there's a new public charge rule, and it's relatively nice. I mean, they say they just they don't just look. Even if you're getting taking taking public benefits for a period of time is not enough to get to get you. You right. know. Uh, age, health, uh, family status, you know, based if you have support structure, uh, assets you have, education and skills uh, you have, and um, there's other things like if you have an affidavit of support filed on your behalf, which is a positive factor, which is always a requirement in a family-based green card case anyway. So, I mean, I remember very briefly after the uh, new public charge rule came into effect, a gentleman, you know, I think called me to uh, ask about a question of, uh, Hey, when I was a kid, I got benefits, you know, from when my mother I, mother uh, died, you know, and uh, now I'm going to be applying for a green card through my uh, new wife. And I said, well, you know, there's no guarantees in life, but you know, you are sound like a fancy adult right now with a job uh, who is perfectly in good health and is going to be capable of supporting him, himself under this new rule. I can't fathom how they can't make a. But if they filed before. It can get complicated. Yeah, this is true. So the so the also uh, one of the nice things that that, uh, that in this new rule, there are certain things they clearly excluded, uh, the supplemental supplemental nutrition assistance program, uh, children health insurance program. Um, um, so things that they will not consider has to do to do with, you know, nutrition has to do with. Children help. Yeah, I mean, there was in, uh, back in the in the COVID uh, when COVID was at its peak. They also said, you know, a general. There's a general, you know, blanket that, like COVID, COVID, you know, treatment, COVID emergency services, you know, COVID government programs. So we're not, we're generally speaking, not going to consider those things as public charge as well. It's a thought. I mean, this is a, uh, honestly, this is a uh, a time bomb that was dismantled timely. Uh, had the Trump administration public charge rule been implemented because it kind of, you know, they lost the election, new administration, they walked away from it. Courts were completely suspect. Some courts were taken back. Oh, other, yeah. other conservative courts did not even have the intelligence uh, to um, understand uh, what this rule is about. But had they carried through with the way they were carrying through the the, the green card process not only would it be humiliating the way they were collecting information, but there could be some serious denials because of this point system they have now. We, and if you are an employment-based immigrant with a salary of one hundred thousand dollars, it's not going to affect you as much. But not everybody is. In I, that I mean, I was fundamentally worried about family-based uh, green cards. It's, you know, it's the person who wants to bring over, you know, mom and mom and dad. You know, the, somebody that that's that sort of thing, or the yeah. young the young person who wants to bring bring a spouse uh, over. Yeah. But I mean, it's relevant to everybody, and uh, these people out in their audience, they got a lot of the brunt of the public charge rule by having to, you know scrape the sides of the barrel of their personal life and dump it in an envelope for USCIS. Yes. You know? So it's a step in the right direction. It's going back to really pretty much to what we were doing before the Trump administration with a additional clarity. Uh, so uh, the Biden administration um, took this opportunity to provide a little bit more clarity for us in a positive way. Yeah. So it's thumbs up for this new administration for uh, Sounds like it makes our job just a little bit a little bit e easier. Well, make everybody's you know? job. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's no need for uh, this uh, this uh, yeah. humiliating process. Yeah. And uh, what about the per country limitation, Brian? Okay, so uh, the Eagle Act, Sam, has uh, soared in once once again into the news feed, and I think I thought That's it was why it's called the Eagle. Act. Eagle, Eagle. See, I can say things like it's it's flap it's flapping our, our our way its way into our conversation, you know, things like that. So you know, about this time last year, there was a whole bunch, you know, a uh, whole bunch of uh, immigration reform related bills uh, running around, and 
Eagle Act is one of them. And Eagle Act, you know, if you go read the history of this bill, some version of it's been around since I think like 1998 or something like that. There's a whole literal website devoted to the Eagle Act, eagleact.info. And so if anybody's feeling uh, bored and wants to read a website about a particular law, uh, feel free. But basically, this is also known as, as uh, House, um, House Number 3648. And basically, here's what it does. It would phases, phases out the per country cap for employment-based immigrants, and it has like, I believe it's a nine-year phase-in period, or maybe it's a seven-year phase-in period, that basically, so it'll slowly put everybody on the same even page in terms of the visa, the visa ba backlog. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah? Let's talk about the likelihood for this bill to pass. <sighs> Well, I mean, for me, I mean, we can talk about it, but I think I think for me, everybody wants to know yeah. what's. The, I mean, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not well, trying, to, is, trying to cause an alarm with, with people. Well, but it is a it is a uh, supported by both parties. Yeah, well, that's the thing, you know. So I'm, you know, Sam. It's supported by both parties. Has bu had bipartisan support. I talked about it last year, and I think the story yeah, the story last year here in our notes says yes. Senate proposed a similar uh, passed a similar proposal in 2020. Couldn't reconcile with the House version before the session ended. And you know, you know, aren't we in the in the period of time, Sam, where a session of Congress is about to end right now? Uh, yes. Um, so I don't know. I'm optim I'm I'm a perpetual optimist, uh, Sam. But what does it do from a practical standpoint? Because I'm not as excited as you are. Why not? Because with the rest of the world retrogressing, it benefits doesn't benefit the real backlog, it doesn't. It doesn't solve the problem. If now we're having a situation where not only China and India, but the rest of the world is retrogressing. Well, uh, it is also okay, this- Okay, they removed the 7%. So great. there's also this provision in there that if you've been waiting for two years for a visa, uh -huh. uh, allows you to file for adjustment of status as well. And that's huge. Yeah. That's huge. It is huge. I mean, yes, I-, I It's it, huge. Sure, I, it's not that huge. Brian. Okay. Uh, Self-employment, you can you can get on adjustment of status after 180 days. You can work for yourself. Yeah, yeah, but you know, uh, you can you can you can port your it's better than nothing. supplement. It's J. definitely all, better all than nothing. All what you better need is supplement J and move than, on. It's better than nothing, but I don't know. It seems like a a it, you know that that brass ring we're reaching for. It turns out it's made it's it's kind of kind of tarnished. It's okay, so I get to work for everyone. I want to still get to not, not be a, a, I'm going to use the term second class citizen, but you're not even a second class citizen. You're not even a permanent, re permanant resident. You are, you are in a weird immigration uh, limbo is, is the bottom, is, is how I'm choosing to describe having a pending green card uh, right now. Plus, I mean, you know, talk, to, talk to me. Should you really abandon your non-immigrant status when you have a pending adjustment of status? You know, it's it. You can, but it's there's a risk associated with that. You know, you don't know if your green card. I think the alternative, the alternative is double uh, dual adjustment, one in EB two, one in EB three. One is retrogressed, so they you can always. I mean, obviously, it, it has to be current to be able to do that. Yeah. Those who did that and took advantage of it, now they're they're maybe not realizing the the good spot that they're in because. If one, God forbid, is denied, you have the other adjustment. You don't have to leave the country. Yeah. And, and, and you have the freedom. And, and if it's retrogressed, nobody's going to look at the second adjustment. So, but uh, fundamentally, you know, but yeah, the, don't the, count the, your chickens before they've hatched. Yeah. Uh, but it's out here. It's again, it's back. There's a little are bit there, of a push, are push there for eggs. It. Being laid around. There, there, there's, there's eggs. Uh, there's, there's eggs. It's w one single egg out there, and uh, this also has some interesting changes to the H1B program a as well. That's built into the, into the bill, but I'm not going to really dive deep into those right now. It's basically sum it up in a sentence, Sam. The Eagle Act is, you know, back squawking its way across the uh, the he the headlines of those of us who have get immigration centric headlines because we're always googling immigration things anyway. You know, that's it. You know, um, I do Google immigration. Do you? I, I have to admit. Yeah. Um, and there was a nice. We, all, we, we have. I mean, you have. I have Google Google alerts for you know adjustment of status, visa bulletin, H one B, H four, and a couple other uh, immigration uh, yeah. categories. Yeah. And and the uh, there was a good talk about uh, Australia, UK now. And Canada is have done it, and they are even taking it to the next level of creating a more aggressive immigration policies, and um, to trying to attract uh, professionals. 
Um, so um, at, wh at what point would this uh, Congress wake up and understand that we need to do something to stay competitive? I don't know. Well, yeah. Um, so, but there's a lot of uh, activities worldwide uh, to attract uh, professionals, engineers, and you know, uh, human resources. Do you think uh, that? Do you, th do you think, though, Sam, has been a major, you know, brain drain from the United States over this visa back backlog, though? I mean, their numbers are not out. We don't know that. We have no idea. Uh, How do you even get, even, even compare compare that? How do you even calculate what, who has left the United States? I mean, well, I mean, there are there are people who can sit down and statisticians who can look at numbers and compare it. But I haven't seen a study done. Yeah. Uh, probably one is due to understand the impact of what has happened. But um, uh, but everything I see, there is a decline. Every curve I look at, you know, H one B approvals in the last fifteen years. The curve is going down. H one B granted, the curve is, is going down. Green card approved, the curve is going down. There has to be a loss of resources, and now we have obviously some H um, one B layoffs. Is is unemployment compensation? Back to the first topic: Is unemployment compensation a public charge? No. Okay. Yeah. So unemployment compensation is not, a, yeah. is not a public charge generally. Uh, before you accept it, look at your state requirements. Um, in normally the first up to 24 weeks, and it varies from one state to the other, the, um, um, the um, money received is money paid through the employer. So unemployment compensation is nothing but a publicly run insurance program where employers pay money into the insurance program when somebody's lost their job, then the government pays out that insurance uh, proceeds to the employee. So the money is not public money. The money is private money, which is employer's money, not a government money. Um, however, after a certain period of time, there is a federal money that comes into play. And you've got to be careful not to get into that federal money to be cautious. Now, we're all evaluating this public charge rule vis-a-vis -vis, um, um, receiving money due to unemployment from a federal source. The common wisdom has been is to avoid it. Um, this law is, in this list is very broad in nature and interpretation can vary from time to time. So unemployment compensation where the money is paid for by the employer, which is normally in the first 20 to 24 weeks, give or take, depending on the state, is fine. Don't get into the federal aspect, federal money, uh, which usually pays beyond the initial period. And you can look up the, uh, every, the state you're in uh, and it's clear when that money kicks in. Stay clear of that money. Um, so that's what we got for uh, yeah. the public charge rule and the per country limitation, the new law that, that is, well, then the new law, the repackaged law that has been introduced in Congress recently. And when we come back, we're going to take all your questions. Yes, questions, please. We're back. And uh, I am reminded uh, that I must uh, inform everyone that we love all your questions. We want to take all of them. But um, um, the information we present here is informational in nature. And please do not rely on it to make life-changing decisions. Consult with a competent immigration attorney of your choice to help you make a decision on any aspect of your case and while we love everybody there is no attorney client relationship established by you attending uh, this session and us talking to the mic uh, virtually to you uh, and with that we're taking the first question from AK. Let's see what we got. So oh I like this question. 
Uh, my company was acquired and my I-45 has been pending less than six months. It is a successor to interest, so is there any action I have to take with my I-45? My priority date is not current anymore. Well, before we answer the question, I think we should take a moment to talk us about successor and interest because that's assumed in the question and, yeah. I, and I appreciate that. So what is a successor and interest for immigration purposes? Broadly, it's, you know, the new, the new company must assume the assets as well as the liabilities uh, uh, of the old company. You can't, you know, a, a company that, you know, buys, you know, a, a contract or a product, you know, from uh, company A and starts its own business based upon it. Um, uh, even that, I'm a, okay, I'm a lawyer. I don't even like my scenario. I, I want to make an argument uh, based upon it. But basically, you know, uh, it's really all the assets and all the liabilities of the, of, of the business is generally what the mm -hmm. standard is. The acquiring all assets and liabilities of the uh, prior company is not the normal way companies acquire companies. Yeah. Um, it's not the norm. Now, it is not unusual either. It happens all the time. But a lot of times, with large companies, it is the norm. Yeah, stock, a stock purchase, I bought, yeah. I brought up, buy up everything this company is, you know? Yeah, yeah. With a smaller company, it's not normal. Normally what companies do is say, hey, listen, I want to buy all your assets. Your liability is your liability. Yeah. It's your problem. You have a product. I'm buying the product. I'm yeah. buying the employees. Yeah, they build in like a, like a date saying, you know, everything, everything prior to did our execution date is your problem. Everything after is yeah. my, my but problem. But I'm getting your employees. I'm getting your product. And I'm not getting even your lease. I'm not interested in your lease. Go negotiate with the yeah. landlord. So that's called a um, an asset purchase agreement, not asset and liability purchase agreement. Yeah. So when a, uh, a successor and interest is when someone um, uh, purchased both, the easiest way is just purchase a stock uh, purchase. Now, we've talked about that for everybody to understand. Let's answer the question part. So with your I-485, you know, uh, so, so is there any action I have to take with my I-45? My priority date is not current. So, the employer has to take Well, yeah, so, so I guess my, my yeah. secret answer is there's nothing you can do, but basically you have to, you know, uh, ring the bell and uh, cause a little bit of a stink with your employer because you're going to need accessory interest I-140 filing through the new company. Assuming, yeah, I mean, assuming it's not just like a, a name change, which, um, you know. There's an I-140 amendment needed. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's kind 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 of kind of it because basically, if your old company has gone been snuffed out and you replaced with a new one, you you are required to do to do that a new filing through the new company saying. Yeah. Now, do you do it? Um, is there a timing critical issue? You know, well, I I, I got to take a step step back, Sam. Even if a company has been acquired, you know, it doesn't mean you don't. It's not even necessarily a successory interest scenario. Uh, I mean. I just, I mean, you know, AK seems to believe his is, but I mean, a company can be purchased by another company and that company that gets purchased continue, can continue going as a concern. Just not, you get, get my point? Well, I do, yeah. I do get your point, but we don't know enough, but, yeah. uh, for, for, but, but there's a lot of technicality goes into yeah. it. The devil is in the details. There's a very popular case law about the denied I-140 where the company ceased to exist a week, a week after the other company began and that week was sufficient for the government to say there's the lack of continuity between the two. Yeah. So um, obviously that's not your scenario. Uh, so, but, you, but the bottom line, contact your HR, tell them that I, you need to file an, an I-140 amendment for me uh, as a successor in interest. Uh, and um, hopefully they'll file it and you'll be in business. Next question from G. Sixana. Okay. Background, one of two, straight EB-345, concurrently filed November 2020 by previous employer. Received EAD advanced parole, EB-3 I-140 is approved. EB-2 I-485 filed with current employer in September 2022. EB-2 and EAD uh, is are pending, advanced parole is pending. Mm -hmm. uh, two of two, um, USCS, Case status update on the EB3 I-45 says case closed benefit received. Ooh. By other means, no notices sent by USCS. Can I use EB3 advanced parole to travel outside the United States? Well, case closed benefit received by other means telling me that they think that you got your green card. Yeah. 
uh, and something is wrong. Is this here. sort of a repeated topic then? People have been hearing their cases have been administratively closed by USCIS, but getting uh, no notice, right? And yeah. um, well, but he left the prior employer. So the, although the offer of employment, I would assume, is still valid, they, 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 have, they have not withdrawn the I-40. Uh, well, I mean, 180 days left, pass, I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, this, that, the case doesn't necessarily have to, have to I mean, have to have die. I mean, portability sure. or, oh, I was just planning on rejoining that, that, yeah. that employer. Yeah. So yeah. can I use the, so fundamentally, this, can I use the EB3 AP to travel outside the, the United States? I wouldn't. Yeah. Under the circumstances, it's quite risky. Yeah, it's now, a great academic question, but I wouldn't want to be the be the experiment subject in that uh, especially matter. Especially having to explain a complicated uh, uh, advanced parole law to a customs officer at JFK. Uh, Who has no desire to talk to you about you're, this you're, for the record. You're going to lose, yeah. even if you're right on this question. Yeah. So you, you need to resolve the closed case closed benefit uh, by other, received by other means. That needs to be resolved. I would not travel with the EB3 Advanced Pro. Uh, I think it's uh, it's risky for you. Yeah. How does I mean fundamentally, Sam? How does one um, one go into attacking that uh, case closed benefits received by other means? I mean, I think basically you start putting in service inquiries with USCIS. Uh, I would, for curiosity's sake, put in a FOIA to figure out what the heck the, ac the record actually says, and you know. Contacting. I would retain an attorney, uh, maybe uh, those are file, things, a motion, yeah, those, yeah. file a motion, uh, although there's no decision made, but uh, I would say that's a decision. Let them not take it. Yeah. Let them not take the check. They'll, they'll take the check, and then they'll have a case in their hand. They don't know what to do with it. Yeah. I, mean, I would file a mo motion to reconsider. I, I mean, that, that's, I mean that, that is, that's a conservative way to do it. I'm an attorney, so that's going to be my first line of defense. I have to agree with you. It seems like strange, strange and almost a little bit frivolous because clearly they can't just deny a case and never send, send you a uh, notice. But it would seem that they have. and They have been doing that. Yeah. So I don't, I, it's not an option I like, but I can't really argue uh, with it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So send facts. Yes. So my I-485 is pending and I have the opportunity to take up a new role with the same employer. By how much can the new role vary from uh, the role during the I-485 filing? Should it be the same SOC code? What's the guidance? Thanks. Same or similar job classification. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, that's really kind of it. USCIS actually has put out an extensive policy memorandum on this subject. And, you know, same SOC code is a real positive, positive, uh, well, same SOC, same SOC code is a real positive factor. I would think they'd be hard pressed to find your, your job is not a similar occupation. I mean, to be clear, uh, read the policy mem memo rather than the words that are coming out of my mouth. But as I recall, they talk about, you know, if you're in the same sort of, you know, number on the, like you know, the, a lot of IT jobs are in the 15 numbers. If you're in that same, broader number class, you know, it, there's a reasonable argument to be made that you're in the same occupation. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mithun Energy. Yes. My H-1B is expiring and stamped until August 2023. I have a travel plan February 2023 and returning March 2023. Can I renew my H-1B after I come back? 100%. Yeah. No problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you can do that. Anything we can add? No, I mean, I always advocate for, for filing uh, early, but you know, you're still filing pretty pretty early if you're filing in uh, March. I mean, the earliest you can file an H-1B extension uh, is six months out, and yeah. Raul Jane got a question for you, Ryan. Hi, my I-45 is pending. My son's age is locked, meaning all, meeting all four criteria. I presume he's talking about the Child Status Protection Act. He got EAD slash AP combo card. He is on F1 visa and due to, com to complete his undergrad this week. Do we need to apply for F1 OPT? So, um, you know, need to is a sort of a cost uh, benefit analysis, I think, you know, for, for your son. I would question whether or not they would be able to, they would, would be willing to approve that by virtue of the fact that, you know, your son has a pending green card. They would because it's a different category. By the way, they're denying those. Meaning they they, they would think there would be a problem. The same because they they were they were denying them because they're saying it's two EADs under the same 
category, which is employment based. Yeah. That's that's why. Yeah. I think they will approve this F1 OPT. Yeah. And I think he should apply. And I, I don't think saving the money is worth it, in my opinion. I do agree with you. Fundamentally, the conservative path is always to maintain your non immigrant status in the United States and maintain. Getting F1 OPT would, you know, allow, would, would be the way to do that. Yeah, although there's more restrictions on the F1 OPT. But, uh, yeah, it's a little bit, only a little bit for F1 OPT. You have to work in your field of study. Yeah. There is a period of unemployment, but you can, you can, the moment you work on the other EAD, you're no longer on the F1 visa. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's, that's, so that's true, So is it, yeah. so yeah, yeah, I would apply for it for right now. If somebody skips it and doesn't apply for it, it doesn't hurt my feelings. Yeah, I mean, well, I'm gonna, in fun, that situation. Yeah, fun fact: you know, people, people, you know, ask us for advice, and you know, I tell them, you know, obviously, you're, it's not a guarantee. It may not be practical. It might be a thousand one reasons why you won't. Yeah. But conservative path is to maintain your non-immigrant status yeah. always. Two of two. Two of two. Oh, uh, can he travel outside and come back with without any issues since he has EAD AP combo card valid until October 2024? So. Um, now, two of two, there's another one that's three of three. Uh, she tricked us. Should be two of three, Raul, but that's okay. We'll answer that one and jump to two of three. So... If you come back on EAD, you're no longer on F1, and as if you're no longer on F1, it's not worth even applying for EAD. Yeah. But if you're coming back on F1... Um, you're not coming back on F1. You're not going to come back on F1 yeah. because you have an immigrant visa, and therefore you may not be allowed to enter yeah. on F1. So if you're traveling for sure and coming back on advanced parole, for sure you do not need to uh, get that EAD card because it will be worthless very quickly. Yeah. Uh, my son's age is like an EB2, where am I the primary and from my spouse's side? So, is uh, she is, uh, I am the primary and from my spouse's side? So, I think, what I, I, I think I'm going to interpret. Gonna interpret. I think he's saying where... In EB3, he's not locked. Is it safe to withdraw EB3? I think he's saying my, both my spouse and myself have an EB2 I-140, and my son's age is locked pursuant to both of those. But an EB3, he's not locked. He's not locked. Um, so, number one, before you withdraw, you got to talk to a lawyer about yeah. this. This is complicated stuff. Yeah. And you seem to know what you're talking about, and I like that. Informed um, client, informed beneficiary, that's wonderful. Um, but you really need, before you withdraw cases, you need to make sure you're not locked. You need to make sure you're locked in the other two. Uh, and you need to understand the ramification. You need a, an attorney who kind of thinks out of the box, look at scenarios and possibilities for you uh, to help you out. Yeah. All right. Um, so Sanjeev Malik, prior to date, February 2014, born in India, received EAD advanced parole on EB3, supplement J pending for EB2 approval. I-140 approved for both EB2 and EB3. Can I get green card? with any one of them uh, which gets current first? The answer is, let me see here. So you had a supplement J for EB2. Yeah, does that sound like a, like a portability, like a transfer of underlying basis um, for, the, for that, Sam? But that's the only question I'm worried about. Yeah. I'm not sure here whether that's an EB2, an independent EB2 or if it's, uh, from a separate, or is that a uh, transfer underlying basis? I'm gonna say it is not a transfer underlying basis. The reason being is that the priority date is 2014 on EB3. Yeah. Supplement J pending for EB2, I'm on 40 approved. Looks yeah, like the EB2 was filed after that. I'm, we're guessing. If there is a transfer underlying well, basis... No, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Sam. If there's a transfer underlying basis, then no. If there isn't a transfer underlying basis, then there is either one. I'm going, I'm going to say maybe. Uh, so, we all, so I'm going to presume this person has filed a transfer underlying basis, right? Uh, Acceptance of transfer of underlying basis is is discretionary by USCIS, and I have seen, you know, RFEs for example. I don't think they make a decision until they make a decision. I th I think it is possible for them to see to see it, that if this guy is if or anybody is current in the EB three category and the EB two category. I think I have I have literally on my desk right now an RFE on this very on this very subject where USCIS doesn't seem to know what category this guy should be in, uh, but his priority date is close. In, you know, in one of these in one or both of these categories. And I, I'll accept your premise. Yeah. 
uh, but it's uh, with your confirmation is discretionary. It yeah. is not as a right yeah. to him. Yeah. So USCIS can say no. Uh, if there is a transfer underlying basis from EB3 to EB2, USCIS can say no, we've, we're not going to do that. Uh, or they can say yes. Now, if it is not a transfer underlying basis, the answer is clear. If he has two I-140s and two, two, adjust and two adjustments, yeah. and two adjustments uh, it's then, a race. Then the answer is clear. Yeah. Yes. Now, if there is a transfer underlying basis, what Brian is saying is because the Supplement J has not been acknowledged and approved, at the time they're considering the Supplement J, they're going to look at which one is current and they're going to decide which way to go. Yeah. Um, I think, I think but if they approve the Supplement J, you're done. Yeah. Uh, right? You're locked. I'm not, I'm, not sh I'm not sure. I think, again, it says discretionary. Just because they processed out your Supplement J doesn't necessarily mean, you know, they're ready to make a decision on, on, on your case. I, okay. it, it, this is just, this, this opinion the Sam lives in my gut. You know, it is, uh, it is what I've seen by being in rooms with USCIS officers and, you know, the RFEs I've seen. I think they don't, I don't think they really think as hard about this as we think they do until your priority date is current. And if you have... A priority, priority dates, is current. Yeah, until A a priority date is, a priority date is and current. And if you came on on the radar. Yeah. If, if if your priority date is current, comes on the radar, they will try to figure it out. I buy it. Yeah. I buy it. I buy it. I buy what you're saying. Um, Sanjeev, hopefully that was helpful to you. Um, and then we have Arun uh, Prasad. Uh, go ahead, buy it. So I-45 and EB-3 later interfiled back to EB-2 in February 2022. Not approved yet, yet now EB3 is current. Am I an EB3 since interfiled and got approved? And yes, now until it's approved, but the question is, do you, does he need to take action? Well, so, so in the interfiling, the transfer of underlying basis policy is what, 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 what the tub is the term we should be using because that's what USCIS calls it. It says that it is possible to do subsequent requests you know, after you've, you've done a tub once to move around amongst the employment-based categories, right? So, I mean, fundamentally, if your EB3 priority date is current, if you previously sent a, requ sent a request that says, ah, I want to be in EB2, the logical thing, even though it drives me mad, is to send them a letter that says, you know, that what somebody to consider is sending them a note saying, I previously requested to be in the EB2 category. My priority date is now considered current in the EB3 category. Please disregard and move forward with my EB3. Yeah, that presumes the EB3 offer is still uh, valid. All devil's in the details, of course. Certainly. Yeah, you don't don't ask for a green card in the wrong category because um, well, because they will come back for it if they if they if you trick them into doing it. Danny David wants to know how long it takes to get an I-45 approved in the TCS for EB4. EB, EB4, so... It, it, they published the uh, processing time online. Yeah, fundamentally, uh, I mean, the EB, all these things, so how long is it gonna take your, your, EB, your EB4 petition uh, to, case to get approved? That's really the thing. Um, they really shouldn't be discriminating in terms of processing times or adjustment of status. On the 45. Yeah, based upon, yeah. 12 to 18 months is yeah. the answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so uh, we got one here from Raul. Uh, one of two, hello, I received a standalone ad advanced parole document which expires in one year. However, the picture on the document is smudged and my face is not visible. Ouch. Can I still use the document for travel? I would feel, I would feel, a so, so it's a valid travel document, but imagine, imagine coming to the customs guy and saying, this is my official travel document and your face is, your face is smudged. Um, Should I reapply for the document also? Will it cause any issue with renewal next year if I don't choose to re rectify it? Um, well, sh shall I apply for the, for the new document? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, that... Will it cause an issue next year if you don't choose to rectify it? I don't think so. Honestly, I think that comes... I think that's the application. It stinks because you probably have to send back that approved AP. Um, but I think you file the request and I basically, with, with, a, with, a, with a good color copy of your existing AP saying, government error, I can't use this document, and hopefully they can expedite that uh, request yeah. for you. I wouldn't travel with it. Yeah. Siva. Siva. 
Currently in GCAA EAD, priority date 1-2014, planning to change jobs. Should my new employer file I-45J before joining them or when RFE received uh, when priority date becomes current? So, you know, it is possible to, to, to do it as, as, as soon as possible. What's your take on, take on this, Sam? Uh, it is possible, yes. Um. I mean, basically, yeah. what I tend to go by here is what does the, does the, does the government uh, tell you to do? And their policy isn't 100% clear, but they have means for you to file. My, the way I like to do this is to get the Supplement J out as soon as possible. The That's reason, where I was coming, yeah. The reason, the reason I like that, number one, I don't, want, I don't like surprises. Yeah. Uh, this human resource person that you've been talking to is super cooperative and super knowledgeable yeah. but she goes on a nine months leave of absence or a permanent leave of and absence you get somebody who absolutely have no clue or interest in your case and now you got to deal with it yeah i would get it out of the way as quick as possible. yeah some there are some companies out there or people out there who go no when it comes to any sort of immigration form whatsoever and i would i mean that's something i would make part of my my offer of employment yeah. that you're going to guys are going to be willing to issue a supplement j uh, yes. to me and if you have it get it out there yeah rami love hi sam um any chance of august 2 2012 eb3 date of filing in january visa bulletin August 2012 is pretty close. What are we, that we moved up to June, right? Yeah, EB3, yeah. Yeah, so final action dates for employment, yeah, we are in June of 2012. I would it, say yes. It doesn't seem so, it seems so crazy to yeah, me. No, I think I will accept that. When are we gonna get this January visa bulletin, Sam? I mean, it is potentially imminent, uh, but I can't, uh, you know. December 5th. December 5th? In the, uh, last, until, it took a while for them. It took a while last it's month. It's going to take a while for this one, too. So, yeah, so I, I agree with you. I think, you know, if they're going to be doing some recalculating, retabulating, they're not just going to be coughing up a duplicate of yeah. uh, the December visa bulletin. I think we'll be seeing it, uh, well, hopefully not too late. Can the I-140 amendment be filed if the priority date is not current? This is, I think, talk about... Uh, Successor and interest, a very first yes. question. And the yeah. answer is yes. Yes, yeah. You can file the I-140 amendment... Uh, at any time, yeah, absolutely, yeah. not a problem. From VK, so I live in the same MSA of the client location listed on my H1B uh, LCA. Can I now work for a new client located in another state remotely from my home without an amendment? So uh, this is something we've been talking about a lot. Yes, about recently. no, and maybe. Yeah, but but the, but, but go ahead, Brian. So. The devil is in the details. So in terms of government policy on when an H-1B amendment is required, there are two standards. One, they have very clearly said a change in work site uh, outside of your MSA, that for sure, you know, requires an amendment. And you haven't, ticked, this scenario does not tick that one off. However, the other one is a very broad uh, category. It's anything that is a material change uh, in the terms and conditions of your employment. And fundamentally for me, the question would be, you know, what are you doing for that new client? You know, uh, most likely the same. Most likely the same thing. I think there would be a, would be an argument uh, to be to be made then that you know you can start providing services to another another client, but with the requirement to post at uh, your home two posting notices. That's the employer's requirement. That's not your requirement. Yeah. Um, so there's a requirement to post at your home. Uh, to be able to work from home if your home address is not listed in the original H-1B slash LCA petition yeah. for you. Yeah. Uh, can I'm for amendment be filed yeah. if priority date is not current? We answered that one. Um, yeah, same, yeah, same, same, same question. One. So we're getting hit here with the same question twice. Okay, now how long should I wait before a job change after green card approval? Man, we had all, like maybe about four or five months ago, we had a long talk. It was kind of our, our one of our um, main topics here. So the answer is uh, anywhere from zero days until, you know, uh, six months. It's so, the devil's in the details. 
So yeah, exactly, exactly. That's an excellent answer. This is a, an answer, a correct answer, but it's a non-answer, with respectfully, because. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into it deeper. Okay, go. Okay. Go on, yeah. Well, so I'm gonna start with that day zero, zero, or day one scenario. You got your green card. You're very, ha you're very happy. And remember, when you file this green card application, you know your employer says we're offering this permanent position, and I'm taking this permanent position. You guys agree to that, right? Great. Uh, on day one, after your green card's approved, the employer says. Hey man, we're going, we're going, we're going under uh, our company's uh, toast. As of that day, you are permanent resident. Of the, so as of day one of having the green card, you are a permanent resident of the United States. You can work for anybody, uh, and you can stay in the United States for indefinite. So duration. if you're being let go, yeah, you know, basically you met your obligations to get that get that green card. Um, beyond that, though, I mean that's that's my ex my extreme scenario. Well, I'll give you another one to sure. help out here. On day two, uh, your employer says. I'm moving you to a quality assurance from software developer. Uh, I want you to do a completely different technology and um, want you to work second shift. Huge change. Yep. Outside the scope of your I-140 offer and your labor certification, it sounds you, like. You can accept, yeah. but you can reject. Yeah. You can reject it and move on. Yeah. Uh, n day three. Day three. This is a busy, a busy week. Yeah, day three, you get a phone call and say, hey, uh, we're short on money. Uh, we're not running payroll this time. We're running it next time. You can move on. Yeah. So generally speaking. I got a day four. You got day four? What a week, Sam. What a bad week for this company. I would consider leaving this company because they demonstrated to me that they are not stable. <laughs> on, on day four, on day four, you get a phone call from a company that's paying you 25% more. Mm -hmm. Nobody talked to you before. I think you take it. Yeah. It's significant. Yeah. I mean, for a guy like me, you know, you want to be able to demonstrate that you have you have uh, entered into getting in the green the green card in good in good faith. So you should not go into getting that green card planning to leave the company, you know, after after you get it. You should, you know, put all those ideas in a box and put them in the in the in the back of the garage of your brain such that, you know, they should be a non-issue. You should go into that green card taking the uh, taking the green card uh, Oh. So what you should not do is, before you get your green card, send out a resume and interview and say, well, I'm waiting for my green card. Once my green card is approved, I'm going to move on day yeah. two, and then you move. That is a problem. Yeah. Um, I think after you get your green card, you should demonstrate that you took that green, that green card in good faith. Is 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 the is, the, is my conservative uh, answer? Yeah, on there, that. there's no 180 day rule. Or yeah, there's no like no that. no no rule like that. As yeah. long as you can. Yeah. But let's assume the employer met their obligation paid you, didn't change anything, you work in exactly the same job, and two days later he's saying, you know, ah, I don't know, I mean, I want to move. And then, you, and then the jobs out there are comparable. I mean, similar salary, maybe a little bit more money. I'd, uh, I'd, how, so how long can you wait? Well, the law says reasonable period of time. Yeah. What's a reasonable period of time? So that's where the 180 days most likely 180 days is a reasonable period of time because that's the period of time they allow you to port your I-485 yeah. under AC-21. After spending it for 180 days, yeah. So that's where the, and it's not in the law, it's not written in the books anywhere. It is just a by analogy. What we call in the law is by analogy, by looking at other similar rules, how the court or how the regulations address the yeah. scenario, and then we borrow that logic into, into it. Hopefully that answers that question. Yeah. Brian, take the next one. Well, uh, there you go. That's kind of the same thing here. Let's see what else we got next in line here. And there you go. That's kind of the same thing. But there's another one. Are we froze or what? No, there we are. Okay, see you so, is it is it possible to get EAD AP combo card if I receive both separately, have two different exp expiry dates? Unfortunately, uh, no. The EAD, you know, AP combo card was sort of born out of convenience uh, for USCIS. So a little bit of history on yeah. that. So uh, at the very long time ago, once upon a time, USCIS used to charge a fee for the advanced parole and used to charge a fee for the EAD. Mm -hmm. uh, and they then they jacked up the adjustment of status fee so much as we're paying it right now. It was like a lot less money. Um, they were too embarrassed to charge money for the EAD and advanced parole, so they said, well, but the EAD and advanced parole will be free. It's included. 
So when they start doing that, they start doing the combo because they wanted to save money yeah. to adjudicate both at the same time and issue one approval. Yeah. But guess what happened? One slowed the other down and created a crisis because the prior administration uh, did not uh, do certain things in the proper way, they mismanaged uh, the, uh, the review process, and we got COVID. And so they decoupled them, mm -hmm. they separated them, so they can move the advanced parole faster. It looks like they're able to issue the advanced parole a little bit quicker than the employment authorization document. I thought it was the EADs coming, coming, for, uh, coming first rather than the, a, the but, APs. But yeah, yeah, I think maybe it's the other way yeah. around, the advanced yeah. parole. So bottom line, though, is um, I don't think USCIS, I'm, I'm sure they're very happy that they've approved with themselves that so they've approved both your documents. And I don't, they don't, they, they don't have a path to do that is the bottom line. You know, there's no uh, means for them to uh, send, send these back and we'll send, you know, we'll send you a, a combined one. You know? Yes. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I'd like to add, I'm not sure what benefit a combined one will do for you. Yeah. Um, uh, what, what, what's, I mean, why, would you, why do you even care uh, getting a combined one? No matter of convenience. Those AP documents yeah. are, it's are, probably are, are easier big, to manage. And, big and, and, yeah. uh, yes. and uh, clunky, you know? Yes. Uh, Satyan, how That's long the same, the same question should one we, wait for a change? Yeah. Oh. yeah, and then we'll take this last one and maybe we'll wrap it up here. Yeah. So are there restrictions with SSN that comes with the EAD? So, um, yes, you are going to receive a, a Social Security card that says... Ballot with DHS work authorization only, as yeah, I recall? Yes. Yeah. So that is a restricted um, Social Security card that basically tells everybody that you really... Because under the I-9 laws, the employer can receive a driver's license and a Social Security card that's not endorsed with that language for a U.S. citizen to prove that they're authorized to work in the U.S. If you have that endorsement on the Social Security card, then they must, they cannot accept that. Yeah, it's, to tell, it's to tell people they're doing I-9 that they cannot use yeah. this as a, as a valid list schedule, whatever, C. Schedule, schedule C, yeah. C document, yeah. Yes, so with that, you'll get, a, the, you know, your spouse, for example, you, she will get or he will get in an EAD, a Social Security card with that endorsement, but when they get their green card, they can go back to Social Security Administration and replace it with a card that does not have that designation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with that, we conclude today's session, guys. Thank you so much for listening to us. Until next week, you have a great week. Um,